All right, so I would like to start with uh, sex and death. Um, <laughs> so the use of reproductive themes and metaphors in popular culture is pervasive. And not always is it easy to see what the ramifications of these metaphors are. Um, this is a set of metaphors here connect reproduction with weaponry in a classical paper by Carol Cohen called Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals. Um, there is a, a difficulty and irony in associating reproduction with destruction. Um, but apart from that irony, I find two of these um, metaphors appealing, well, maybe not appealing, but useful. Here, we have the hydrogen bomb was Teller's baby, although those who wanted to disparage Edward Teller's contribution, and one of those would be Hans Bertha, um, claimed that he was not the bomb's father, but its mother. Stanislaw, La Stanislaw Ulam was the real father as he had the all-important idea and inseminated Teller with it. <laughs> Teller only carried it after that. So clearly this, this particular quote, um, it actually uh, resonates with an Aristotelian worldview, which I'll talk about later, but which puts, which puts males as the action and females as a receptacle. The second quote below it does something similar. Hydrogen bombs were given male names, and the craters produced by them were given women's names. And so here again, we have male as actor and female as the result of male action. So the metaphors of reproduction have been used pervasively. In more recent times, those metaphors have a slightly different view. Um, we've used visual imagery much more. Uh, we think more, less about brutality and more about beauty, say. But here, too, the metaphors, the gendered metaphors are um, pretty obvious. We have in the upper corner the, a woman's tear um, as Mother Earth or Mother Nature may be crying for the destruction of her world. But then we can juxtapose it with a view of what looks to me like a masculine hand holding the world, or actually the world seems to be springing up from his hand. Um, and that's a world of technology and a world of atoms, a world of reductionism. So we have, we have gendered visual imagery. And down below here, we have um, a surrealistic artist uh, who, who has pictured ha heads of uh, women and men in the forest, but in a very different context. So a woman's head is integrated with the leaves of, the, of nature around her, whereas a male's head is much more transparent, segregated from the forest behind him. And his brain is obvious to us, whereas the woman's brain is completely clouded. So these images of these metaphors of, of reproduction in culture are very poor, very put, have a lot of potential. They're very useful. But metaphors also go the other way. And, and that's what the topic of this particular talk is really about. Um, although the power of metaphor in influencing culture is pretty obvious from the past two slides, using culture as a metaphor in science is not quite so obvious. And yet it's very much a part of reproductive biology. I am not a women's history scholar. I'm not a historian. Um, I haven't studied uh, formally gender issues. Uh, and yet here I am talking to you about them. So that's a little bit daunting, I must say. Um, however, I do have 30 or 40 years under my belt of um, reproductive biology. And so I hope that I'll be able to use that as a, as a foundation for what I'm trying to say. But I have had two sets of experiences in the kind of field that I'm going to be talking about. The first one was in 2000, when I was invited to give a talk at a seminar called a Symposium on Classical Gender Constructs in Biology. I had done nothing in that kind of part of the field up until then. And the only reason I agreed to give the talk was I was mentoring 
a woman who wanted to have, who was trying to get tenure. And so I went there <laughs> and I did it. And I learned a great deal about women in science, about classical gender issues. You'll see I'm going to bring Aristotle up again, um, ca classical gender constructs. Um, and it was a very transformative experience in many ways. But it wasn't until 12 years later when I took part in a Khan Institute symposium um, where I actually spent a whole year talking about mothers and others uh, in the context, well, in a broader context, because I was the only biologist in the room. I was also the only Division III person in the room. So we were talking about motherhood, about reproduction in the context of literature, in the context of art, in the context of religion, in the context of sociology. So very different ways in which I had ever really looked at it before. Oops, wrong thing. So my thesis for today is that historical biases led to misconceptions about conception and other aspects of reproductive biology. This is clearly a picture of the book. I have it here. 20% off if you email me. <laughs> but apart from that, the book was the, the Con Symposium project, which was a whole year, and the book had a similar birthing period or pregnancy, if you will, because the first iteration of the proposal to write the book happened at the very beginning of the Con Institute Symposium or project, and the final iteration of the proposal was at the very end. And so, as my co-author and I, Terry Orr, and this is not Terry, by the way, this is Kay Holkamp, who is a 73 graduate of Smithy, 73 Smithy, who worked with Betty Horner um, and Don Reutner, but I don't think Don's here. Anyway, um, Terry and I uh, worked on this book, worked on the proposal for this book while the whole con project was going on. And then for the next three or four years, Terry and I worked a lot on the book. But the conversations that were engendered, pun intended, by the talks that I had with people at the Khan Institute were also part of the conversations I had with Terry afterwards. Now, Terry was a postdoc and still is a postdoc. So she was at the very beginning of her career, at the cutting edge of her career, and I was more at the tail end of my career. And so we interacted together from two sides, and we brought the ideas together such that it's really hard to tell where one of us begins and the other one ends. So it was a terrific collaboration, an absolutely terrific collaboration. One of, Ter one of Terry's contributions was to say that we needed a story somehow to tell across the arc of the book. And she had read a book about physiological zoology where the, the scientists would, were very involved in shorebirds and they, they, they connected everything in the book to a shorebird. Well, Terry and I don't have a single animal that we study <laughs> at the same time. But we knew of a very interesting animal and that was the hyena, the spotted hyena. So Terry's, through Terry's idea, we have the start of every chapter starts with a vignette about a spotted hyena that integrates the topics of that chapter with a hyena's life. A hyena is also a terrific way to introduce misconceptions. <laughs> because the hyena is, ex is misunderstood, to put it lightly. Um, so Disney and others have had a field day with the laughing hyena, who does not laugh. Um, they are seen as dark and devious creatures, scavengers, which they actually, they do scavenge a little, but they're actually very strong hunters, and lions scavenge more hyena kills than hyenas scavenge lion kills. Um, they are not fantastically wrong, I'm glad to say. They are not misunderstood except by us. They understand each other very well. And as far as they're concerned, they also don't have weird sex. <laughs> this is more a picture of a real hyena. And Kay Holkamp, which is why I had her in the slide before, studies hyenas. So this is a woman sun scientist studying this particular mammal. And while I'm thinking about it, I, every chapter in the book also showcases a particular female scientist. Her science, not necessarily her life. 
So, so the book is a compilation of female scientists written by female scientists focusing on female scientists and focusing on reproduction from the female perspective. Here's our, here's our misunderstood and misrepresented uh, spotted hyena, not laughing hyena, so crocutta, crocutta. Females are larger than males, they're stronger than males, they dominate males. Even the smallest female hyena is dominant to the largest male hyena, which isn't all that big. <coughs> and females have much larger geni genitalia than males. So in lots of ways, they're very, very much not what we come to think about our assumptions of what mammal, mammalian biology is all about. So getting away from the introductory material, setting the stage, um, the, real, the real meat of this talk is about historical bias and historical bias in reproductive biology. And there's basically three avenues in which that bias gets expressed. Um, there's the anthropomorphic bias, anthropocentric bias, and medical bias, and I'll explain each of those, although they're pretty obvious in the next slide. But the bias is a result of who did the science. And for most of reproductive biology, the science has been done by men, not women. Um, and so the fact that science was done by men meant that men were choosing what to look at, choosing how to look at it, and naming the things that they saw. And that's had an enormous impact on the way we uh, understand reproductive biology. So we've got anthropocentric bias, which is looking at reproduction from a human lens. Um, I'm going to do a short section on that where we'll talk about sex chromosomes and menstrual or estrous cycles. Then there'll be a much larger section on androcentric bias in reproduction, so looking at it from a male point of view. Uh, misconceptions about conception comes right in there, uh, along with some issues of naming and imagery and language. And then finally, I'll have a short section on medical bias, so that looking uh, at miscarriage and luteal uh, deficiency, so that, that the medical community frequently looks at reproduction from the lens of the output and a successful output. So we want to produce progeny, and anything that doesn't produce progeny is bad and therefore is labeled as being bad. So let's start with anthropocentric bias. So this is the human lens. Uh, this is a human set of chromosomes. This would be me. This would be Aristotle. <laughs> so in, in mammals, uh, where you have the homogametic sex, so you have two X chromosomes, you end up with a female. And if you have heterogametic chromosomes, you have a male. Such is not the case for everything in the world. In fact, birds, it's the absolute opposite. So for birds, females are heterogametic. Females are essentially XY, and males are homogametic. Males are XX. To keep it straight for mammals, and because we're mammals and we don't like to think that something else is not doing it the way we do it, we renamed them. We renamed them ZW and ZZ instead of XX and XY. <laughs> that keeps us different. But not just differences between birds and mammals, but there are also differences within mammals with respect to sex chromosomes. For one thing, you can have multiple sex chromosomes. So you can have four set, five sets of them, or five sets of them here for echidnas and platypuses. Or you can have a YY and no X at all for a male. You can have both sexes be XX, both sexes be XY, or both sexes missing the Y altogether. So that the, our, our human-centered view of the world doesn't match the way the rest of the world may go. And then it limits our understanding or the questions that we might ask. Um, I've got the, if the, well, if the material on any of the past two slides surprised you, then <laughs> guess what? You fell into the trap. Um, now, hormonal cycles also have ways in which we show an 
anthro anthropocentric bias and an androcentric bias, but this should be, uh, that should be, well, I got it wrong. Um, here is a, a cycle for human females. For those of you who are not completely aware of it and those of you who don't live this every day of your lives, which I don't anymore, thank you. <laughs> this part up here is what's happening in your brain over the course of when your oocyte develops, ovulates, and then becomes a corpus luteum. So in your brain, two different hormones are peaking or not peaking, depending upon how close it is to ovulation. And these hormones are regulated by external stimuli and internal stimuli. So if you don't weigh enough, these may go away. So anorexia, for instance, or, or lots of exercise, too much exercise, maybe. Um, but otherwise, they also are being responsive to weather, to, to pressure, to whether or not they're diseased or whatnot. So this is the way in which the body is integrating, or one of the ways in which the body integrates the environment with um, reproduction. This is what's happening in the ovary itself from, and each of these, this is the little oocyte here, and the oocyte is staying the same size pretty much throughout this um, progression. But what changes are the cells around the oocyte, which are ovarian cells. So they're cells that are part of the ovary. And those cells get more and more and more and lots and lots and lots of layers, and that's called a follicle. And that follicle eventually releases its oocyte. That's ovulation. And when after that follicle releases its oocyte, it involutes and produces a whole new structure called the corpus luteum, which produces progesterone. Here's the hormones in the ovary while this is going on. So estrogen is being created by these follicle cells and rises and rises and falls at ovulation and then evens out. And progesterone is created by the corpus luteum starting at ovulation and then going for a long period of time. And if you manage to get pregnant, then this stays for a long time. So that's, that's us. That's me. That's you. Even if you have a Y chromosome? No, not quite. But that's not the case for all mammals, not at all. These graphs are um, assembled so that the ovulation is all in the same place in each of them. But their hormonal cycles, their hormonal levels are really different. So for women, the purple line is our progesterone line, which we saw before. For cows, this orange line is the progesterone line. And it's happening before ovulation. Here's ovulation. That looks like a little Pac-Man. It's not. <laughs> so here we have progesterone before, uh, before ovulation rather than after. Down in giraffes, we have, uh, we have progesterone before and after. And then down here in elephants, oh my, elephants are, are very interesting. We will not say weird, right? They are interesting. They have a set of follicles that form, and then they don't ovulate, but they start producing those corpus lutea these things here, but without ovulation. And so they start producing progesterone. And another set of follicles start developing. But one of them does ovulate, and then we go progesterone more. But we have these accessory corpus lutea, and there can be up to four to seven, something like that. So a number of follicles develop, don't ovulate, but still involute and produce corpus lutea and produce progesterone. So these are all mammals. They're all from the basic way in which mammals are formed, but they do things really differently. Here's, here's the more anthropocentric bias of the whole story. This is, this is women, for the most part. Most of you, most of the time, had cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle for a long, long period of time without interruption. That is abnormal for mammals. Most mammals do not cycle repeatedly. If they cycle repeatedly, it's what here. In natural populations, the non-pregnant cycle is a rarity and is essentially a pathological luxury which cannot be tolerated. The repeated cycling we see is for in animals, so in cows and in 
although cows are pregnant a lot of the time, but horses or dogs, uh, cats, sort of, um, is mostly a part of captivity. It's an artifact of cat captivity because they aren't allowed to mate. They're in the, in the wild, they would cycle once, maybe twice, get pregnant, go through pregnancy, go through lactation, cycle once, maybe twice, maybe shut down the system altogether if it's winter, so not cycle at all, then come spring, cycle once, maybe twice, get pregnant, lactate, shut it down or keep going. That's the natural cycle. That's not what we as humans do. And that may be part of the reason why we have problems. More on that later. OK, so we covered anthropocentric bias, seeing the world through our own eyes as humans. But as I said before, most of the people who did science early on were males. So they saw the world, the biological world, the reproductive world, in the, from the viewpoint of males. So we're going to go through a long section on androcentric bias, on male bias. I'm going to do one quick slide on behavior, lots of bits about misconceptions about conception, some on naming, some on imagery, and some on language and consequences. And then we'll get to medical bias. Are we ready? All right. Androcentric bias is essentially female passive male active. And that bias um, can be very blatant. In this textbook from 2011, um, female sexual behavior is divided in these two characteristics. Attractivity, which is the stimulus value of a female to a male. Or receptivity, the stimulus value of a female for eliciting an intravaginal ejaculation. This is a 2011 textbook about female sexual behavior. And one of the figures that illustrated in this chapter was of a male smelling a female's butt. So it was about male behavior, not female behavior. There are other ways of looking at female sexual behavior. Instead of attractivity, you could talk about solicitation, which is behaviors and cues used by females to attract potential mates. Or you could talk about facilitation instead of receptivity. So you've got behaviors and cues used by females to achieve conception. So you can put it in the female's perspective, and there isn't, there isn't a reason to define female sexual behavior from the male perspective. But one, one of the more blatant um, misconceptions in reproductive biology has to do with fertilization. And the misconception is that, all, that conception is all about the action of males and their sperm, and that female and their females and their ova are passive recipients. So the next few slides are going to show you why that's probably not the case. All right, but we're starting with Aristotle. So here's where it all began. So this is beginning way, way, way long before now. The father's semen provides the embryo with its form, a replication of his own. The semen carries motions to the embryo, but not matter. After its initial work is done, it dissolves and evaporates away. The active powers in the seminal fluid operate on the corresponding passive powers in the female, in the mother's residue. The matter for the embryo is the menstrual fluid, a residue of the mother. So in Aristotle's view, sperm provide the essence, per, sperm are active, and the soul of humanity, which in their view was of mankind. And females passively provide the material the, the, to nurture or create a body. This old conception is also a popular conception. <laughs> um, there are plenty of video games out there. You can get one for your Android if you <laughs> want. Um, about the great sperm race. The human life started with winning the first race of its life, its existence. So let's take you back to that first race of your life, the race against 250 billion other sperm and fertilize the egg. You go, girl. Hmm. Which brings me to a tangential point. So sperm are, there's X sperm and Y sperm. Are there male sperm and female sperm? 
are the X sperm female sperm and the Y sperm male sperm? Why do we call all sperm males? You'll see a couple of slides where cartoons where all the sperm are, are males. But in this next bit, not all the sperm are males. There's a, there may be a, there's a female in here somewhere, I think. Now, this, this is a National Geographic Channel 2010 documentary on the sperm race, the great sperm race. Telling us the story of human conception as it's never been told before, as helicopter-mounted cameras, world-renowned scientists, CGI and dramatic reconstruction bring to life the extraordinary journey of sperm from ejaculation to egg. Egg is a problematic word, but I'll, we'll talk about that later. Scaled up to human size with the sperm played by real people. <laughs> real people. So we have real people who are apparently running up the vaginal canal. <laughs> OK. Again, this is male active, female passive, right? Females are mountains. Females are solid. Females are there, but they're not moving. They're not interacting. We've just got this bunch of sperm racing up, racing up, racing up, funneling in. Maybe they're going through the cervix there. I don't know. Actually, this is supposed to be the cervix, but there we go. There is one point in this documentary where the female is involved. She's here. She's Tolkien's orc armies. <laughs> She is the, her immune system sent to kill off the male sperm. So I'm afraid this great sperm race is alive and well in um, popular culture, but it is actually not the case. Uh, sperm do not race to the site of conception. As we knew 70 years ago, it's highly unlikely that sperm motility has the slightest value for ascent through the oviduct. In fact, Sperm do not have the energetic resources nor the directional ability to travel on their own power to the site of conception. They just can't do it. <laughs> Whoops. Yes, and these cartoons say that maybe Meryl's lack of directional sense started very early on. <laughs> All right, what actually happens? So they can't race to the site of conception, what happens? The vagina is really complicated, especially in some animals. In this case, which is a baleen whale, um, there are all these little ridges, furrows, grooves, places where sperm can get held and caught. Um, they can get stored. Um, there are grooves and furrows along through the rest of the uterus plus the cervix that is, that is a, a um, <coughs> collapsing point where sperm have to get through. This particular thing is a cast of a dolphin's vagina. Now, this dolphin was dead, so it's not clear that this is, an abs is a good representation, but it's spiraled. Plus, the whole um, uterine tract, the whole reproductive tract, is covered in villi. So at the microscopic level, there are all of these little parts of cells that are moving and throwing. There is a whole lot of motion going on in the reproductive tract now as we're sitting here, but also during copulation. So that the reproductive tract is contracting, the muscles are moving, the reproductive tract has lots of muscles that go in different directions. So the reproductive tract, and it's fluid filled, there's a whole lot of not water, but gelatin or mucus uh, liquid. And the, the contractions and the cilia movement, they all propel sperm or impede sperm to the places where it's appropriate for them to be according to the female's reproduction. So that reproduction is well and truly under the control of a female. She, her orgasmic and the other contractions alter the dynamics of the reproductive tract so that sperm are sent to the places in which, where they're needed, which may be that they're not needed and they have to wait a while. And that's not the end of the story. In addition, when they're deposited, sperm can't do it. <laughs> Sorry. They're not able to fuse with an ovum. They don't have the 
They don't have the shape, the form. This, here's a sperm that is pretty much ready. Here's a sperm as it comes out of the male reproductive tract. It has these layers of cholesterol. It has stuff going on here. It's got a big cap on it. All of those have to change, and the thing that changes them is the female's secretion, the female's reproductive tract. So female secretions bio biochemically alter sperm. They alter sperm such that the sperm can actually swim better. They make them able to swish their tails a lot faster. They get rid of this baggage. They, they remove a part of the sperm head, which um, allows the, the sperm then to have greater uh, access to ova. So in general, once female obtains sperm, her body manages their activity and function, and we haven't even gotten to conception yet. So we'll get there. So up here is a, um, an ovum as it's ovulated, but the ovum is in the inside and it's covered with ovarian cells. Now this is, a, this is an animation, this is not the real thing. So the, the ovum at ovulation uh, is, takes a bunch of ovary with it, or the ovary exudes the ovum plus a bunch of ovarian cells. And those ovarian cells protect the ovary, keep it safe, because the oviduct has to do something really interesting. The ovulation is happening here. Sperm deposition is happening down here. You've got to get sperm moving one way and an ovum moving the other way. So the reproductive tract has to get, get two different kinds of things moving in two different directions to get to the same place. And part of that um, happens with the way the, the outside cells of the outside of the ovum interact with the <coughs> oviduct. Actually, at conception, the sperm doesn't penetrate the ovum, but is engulfed by it. So we don't have sperm penetration. Sperm tails are really useful for getting through this outer coat of ovarian cells. So that's where their little tails come in useful, is getting through here. But down here, they get engulfed by, um, they get engulfed by the ovum. And then the ovum does lots and lots of things. So I've listed them here. It digests the sperm head, it degrades the tail, it encases the sperm DNA to form a pronucleus. It encases the, the ova DNA to form a pronucleus. It degrades the paternal mitochondria. It builds the machinery needed to pull the pronuclei together, which is what is happening here, and thus create a single nucleus, which in some views might be conception at that point. All the material for that activity comes originally from the mother. So it comes from the ovary. And it's laid down into the ovum before conception, before ovulation. And all of that material, including mitochondria and regulatory proteins and lots of structure, regulate not only conception, because the ova DNA isn't active yet, because it hasn't fused with the, the pronucleus, the male pronucleus, all of that regulation is done because of the maternal involvement in the oocyte. So, misconceptions <laughs> about conception. Sperm don't race to the site of conception. Orgasmic and other contractions alter the fluid dynamics of the reproductive tract and propel or impede sperm as needed. Female secretions alter sperm to enable conception. In general, once a female obtains sperm, her resources manage their activity and function as well in conception itself. So for the most part, sperm are passive, not active participants. Thus, Aristotle got it wrong. Conception is female active, male passive. But our language doesn't help. Um, our language about conception reinforces the Aristotelian fallacy. Insemination, fertilization, and impregnation are all male active, female passive words where conception, the word conception is gender neutral. 
So I advocate that we switch and stop using the word fertilization or insemination or impregnation and just start using the word conception in all of those cases. We've got a problem with the verb fertilize because we do not have a neutral term that's, that we can use. We can say she conceives, but he fertilizes and she conceives doesn't quite work either. So we don't have a neutral alternative for that. I can see using fertilize for strawberries, but I won't go into a fruit analogy there, metaphors with fruit. Um, but we've got other ways in which the uh, reproductive biology and language are problematic. Um, Cameron's in the audience here. Cameron pointed this out to me and Rebecca, one of my students, that the etymology of the word vagina is to mean sheath or scabbard which may fit with the very first slide about the confluence of reproduction and weaponry, but not in, far, not in my body, thank you. And then the word androgen, which comes from andro for male human, fine, but estrogen comes from the Greek for estrus or frenzy, gadfly. Um, here we are being gadflies at the <laughs> Women's March last week. <laughs> Here I am being a gadfly saying, go conception, no fertilization, go. <laughs> All right, so language, even the etymology of words has some hidden bias associated with it. Androgens are interesting in another case. Uh, Elizabeth Adkins Reagan was my thesis advisor at uh, Cornell, and she has a book on hormones and reproduction. This is a quote from her. The association of androgens with masculine traits and estrogens with feminine traits is also a poor fit with nature's ways. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is that testosterone is converted to estrogen in the brain of males. So estrogen is actually doing a lot of the work for male behavior, not androgens. A second problem, and probably even a more significant <coughs> problem, is that if we think of androgens as associated with male traits, then we look for how androgens are associated with aggression um, or with antagonism or with competition. And we don't look for the effects of testosterone on cuddling or on responses to baby cries. Well, somebody finally did, Sari von Anders did, and finds a correlation of testosterone levels in both of these things. But if we're only thinking about androgens as male hormones, we aren't necessarily going to look for the other things that they can do. So language does sometimes inhibit the hypothesis formation that we might have as scientists, and it certainly has in this case. Here's another language issue. No features of male anatomy are named after women, but several parts of fem female anatomy are named after men. And here's a list of them. And it's not surprising that these names were coined by men to honor men, and the trend continues, as the G-spot here was named after a man in 1981, so not all that long ago. In this case, thankfully, we have alternatives, so we don't have to say Skeen's gland, we can say it's a prostate, more about that in a minute. We don't have to call it a, pro a graphene follicle, we can call it a preovulatory or mature follicle. We don't have to say fallopian tube, this part here, the oviduct, so we don't have to honor fallopius on that one. <laughs> Bartholin's gland, we can call it a bulbourethral gland, which is actually probably the best thing to do because males have this gland too, so why call it something else? And then the G-spot, we can call the erogenous spot or find some other word for it if we want to. But I promise more about the prostate and here, uh, Aristotle actually got it right. So here's Aristotle again. Uh, Aristotle noticed that this, the discharge accompanying sexual pleasure in the female contributes nothing to the embryo. That's true, okay. The actual discharge does not take place within the uterus, but it is in the region in front of this where the female discharges the moisture where the male emits the semen. And that would be right in here. Women and other female mammals have a prostate gland. It's been called Skeen's gland for a long time, but it's a real prostate. 
It's in the same position as in males. It secretes the same secretions. It expresses PSA, prostate-specific androgen. It has the same embryology, the same biochemistry, the same structure, vasculature, and it produces an ejaculate called squirting, or the Chinese actually have a character for that. <laughs> they don't even call it the female ejaculate, which is what we call it. They've got a real word for it. It also becomes cancerous. And that's where the problem arises, because if you use the word Skene's gland instead of prostate, you may not even think to look for prostate cancer in a woman who has some cancerous growths in that part of her anatomy. So in this case, using a non, or not using the word for the thing that it is because it's thought of as a male thing rather than a female thing means that you're going to delay diagnoses or you're going to mistreat um, particular ailments. So, the language is biased, but is the science. So, early anatomists were men. Did they privilege male anatomy? I thought of one small way to test it, so I'll show you my small way of testing it. This is the Terminologica Anatomica. It is a listing of all the, formal listing of all the anatomical terms um, for cadavers and for everything else. It's got about 7,500 macroscopic anatomical structures. There's also another one for, cyto for things inside cells. So since it does the genitalia, I went and added up all of the terms for various parts of female and male genitalia and tallied it up to see whether we'd have more in one, one side of the aisle or the other. Well. Female anatomy is giving 15% fewer terms. So there are 15% fewer named features. Here in the internal genitalia, females have four more terms than males, but it's broken down kind of oddly. Ovaries only have 18 terms to describe an ovary, but the testes, this little thing here, has 30, has, oops, where is it? Has 25 terms. The actual tubes associated with reproduction are really complicated in women. They, all of this part and has various segments and what. Not surprisingly, there's 63 terms associated with that part of female anatomy. But the male tube is this thing going up here and down around it here. And it's got 29 terms associated with it. In glands, male glands come out way up. Uh, external genitalia, we've got the same kinds of issues, but here are identical structures. Here are the things that are the same in males and females. The prostate, one term, 23 terms. And the urethra, 17 terms for a female urethra, 32 for a male. And these are identical structures. So it's probably the case that male anatomy is biased. It's looked at in greater detail. Okay, sometimes bias is um, fairly subtle, and it's from images that are doing the bias. Um, and th I'm going to start playing this little video because it takes about a minute. Oops. It takes a minute, and the actual action is halfway through, which is this ovulation happening. So it's a 50. It'll go. Will you go? There it goes. The point of showing this video is to show you how difficult, maybe impossible, it is to see ovulation. So you will not, you will hardly see what, I can't tell. Um, but what's happening somewhere along in here, I think is supposed to be, maybe it's in here now, is supposed to be the oocyte coming out with its, its surrounding um, ovarian follicle. But I can't see it. But this is the way it's illustrated in a textbook. It's illustrated as an eruption, a volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. It's released, almost like an ejaculation, maybe. Who knows? Um, but, any, but the process is definitely much more gradual than that. It is not an explosion. Um, this, in this image is, was taken. It's a still shot. It's static. You don't see what the dynamic action is. And in fact, the dynamic action is probably more of an oozing um, than of an explosion. So the imagery can be misleading. 
Um, what you see may not be what you get. Even when you have a video, it's still really hard to see what's going on. But there are more subtle ways of um, biasing the way you look at things. This is a 2009 cartoon from a textbook on uh, human development and embryology. The, it's going through genital development. We've got a seven and nine week um, embryos at the top, then 12 weeks for male and female, and at the bottom, late fetus. So that's about eight or nine months. So a big gap between, big gap between here, here, huh? this one's better, between here and here. But let's look at four different ways in which this particular diagram is deceiving. First, as illustrated, the neutral indifferent gonad here is a genital tubercle. Now it turns into a phallus. This is at nine weeks when none of the other structures have been gendered, according to the diagram. Then we move to nine weeks, to 12 weeks. Now the phallus has become a clitoris. Really? And the phallus has become a penis. Okay, I'll take that. That's the same word. So that's one issue. A second issue. We've got, um, we've got gender names now here and here. Why do we have the legs here in the female side? That's, that's sort of repeating the infantile condition here. They took away the legs here. Why didn't they take away the legs here? It makes the female, again, more infantile. Even more subtly, but with, with the same effect, is the length of these arrows. The arrow to here is much longer. It takes a whole lot more to get to a male than it does to get to a female. Female is a whole lot more infantile. So another, another subtle way of reinforcing female infantile, female not as evolved, whatever. And then finally at the bottom, We've shrunk the female anatomy, but not the male. So that biases and misconceptions can come in, like the second slide that I showed of the heads, the male head and the female head of the teardrop. Imagery can be really riveting, and, but it captures us internally without us thinking about it. And imagery such as this here, which is used in a textbook diagram, is telling stories that aren't really being told. And in this case, stories that are misconceptions. Brings us to a big, important question. <laughs> I want all of you to think, what is a penis to you? <laughs> Thinking? So. When you're thinking about it, does the term refer to morphology? So you just had time to think about it. Does it refer to embryology? Does it refer to function? How in your own mind do you define a penis? We're going to go back to our hyena here. Remember our hyena with her enlarged genital structures, genitalia that are way larger than males? What would you call her genitalia? So you've just been thinking about the definition of a penis. That somebody who didn't know this was a female would say that was a penis. So what are we going to call it? Are we going to call it a penis? Are we going to call it a large clitoris? Are we going to call it a female phallus? Are we going to call it a pseudopenis? We don't know. Here's the, just because of digression, this is the actual reproductive anatomy of a female hyena. So here's where her uterus is. That's where the baby's got to go there, make a quick right turn, and then come all the way down and out. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not e Birth wasn't easy for any of us, both male and female, but we were on opposite ends maybe of it. Um, but it's really hard for female. And female, the stillborns for the first um, nulliparous or primiparous females, females who are giving birth their first time, lots of stillborns. And as the baby come up, it does, the baby creates an episiotomy, um, and at that point, um, the female is scarred, and you can actually identify uh, different females by their scarring patterns. But anyway, we don't know what we call it. Here's another, um, 
what is the penis. Here is another, another case. Um, so these scientists um, are figuring that they've just um, made billions of dictionaries outdated, and all because of this tiny two to three millimeter Brazilian cave insect that subsists on eating bat carcasses and guano. But here's the key point, 40 to 70 hour copulations. What is it doing? <laughs> all right, this is what it's doing. Female is on top. Female inserts her penis into the male. She uh, opens up a membranous pouch, um, which has some spines on it too, inside the male. So in, in the scientist's words, uh, the female deeply penetrates the male, inflates her penis within the male. Numerous spines on her penis anchor her to him. And during the long copulation, she absorbs or imbibes um, sperm and nutrients. And the scientists, these are not a good thing, I don't recommend doing it, tried pulling them apart, and the male's thorax detached from his abdomen. That's how tightly she was holding on to him. This does not happen in nature. Scientists do not come around and pull <laughs> two to three millimeter insects apart. But it does beg the question of what are you gonna call a, femis, a penis? If you think about your earlier, how you defined it, what do you use there? Okay, we've got an equivalent problem with defining an egg. What is an egg? We've already used an egg in different ways. We can, an egg can either be a female gamete or it can be a zygote. Um, and in that, and in, so in laboratory parlance and in, even in print, the oocyte, ovum, zygote, marula, and blastocyst are frequently referred to indiscriminately as the egg. Thus, we can plate the female gamete with the product of reproduction with embryo. And so the female now is no longer herself, but she and her embryo are sort of the same thing. So we've got androcentric bias in lots of different ways. One, one misconception I don't want everybody to make is conflating control or choice with voluntary decision making. So there is a tendency, if I say that females are controlling reproduction, females are choosing sperm, or females are responsible for conception, that we could have people thinking that if a woman is raped and gets pregnant, then she decided to be pregnant. She made the choice, she was in control. And that's not what's happening. This is unconscious, physiological phenomenon. We are stuck with English that has a subject and a verb. And so is it female active, male passive? As soon as I say females active, that in some minds entails choice, it entails volition, it entails voluntary um, action. And that's not what's going on. But that is a way in which a lot of this could be misconstrued and not to the female benefit. Okay. Medical bias, Annalise, I'm quoting Annalise, she's here. Uh, she's the one that noticed female mammals have long been neglected in biomedical research. Um, and only until 1993 did the, did the NIH actually require females to be included in human clinical trials. And this is partly why. It's because in medical physiology, reproduction is considered secondary, not primary. So here's here is a traditional breakdown of medical physiology, a, a table of contents, as you were, going through the major systems. Uh, reproduction is not considered one of those major systems. In my mammalian physiology course at Cornell, reproduction was not covered. It's a problem. Um, but it's a problem because reproduction, because females are not considered normal because Physiologists see, if, if they see that pregnancy and lactation disrupt normal physiology, that's the way they view it. So normal physiology is what happens in males or in non-pregnant, non-cycling females, but in reproductive females, reproduction disrupts normality, and therefore females are not normal in some sense. Because as you remember going back, Almost all the time, females are reproductive. They're pregnant, they're lactating, they're pregnant, they're lactating, maybe they stop. 
So their physiology is actually going on all the time. And in some ways, since reproduction is key to evolution, the physiology of females is what's really the physiology of life. It's female physiology that's driving male physiology. It's reproductive physiology because having babies that have babies that have babies is the name of the game. So medical physiology is biased. It's biased because it's looking at the output, not at what's actually happening. So we want more cows or more piglets or more, more puppies, or we want more babies. And that means that medical terminology is value-laden. It's value-laden in the sense that if something is, might possibly, maybe, or has ever been shown to interfere with having a baby, it is not good. So it's luteal deficient instead of a short luteal cycle, or a cervical incompetence, or miscarriages. We're going to deal with two of these really quickly because we're just about out of time. Another misconception is that the men, and this has to deal with the short luteal cycle, is that the, that the normal cycle for women is 28 days. And there is a, the 14 days before ovulation and the 14 days after ovulation. And this is consider, considered the luteal phase because you've got the corpus luteum. Here's information about normal, estrus, normal menstrual cycles which are not 28 days. In fact, for any given female, most of your cycles are not anywhere near your mean cycle length. That your cycles are highly, highly, highly variable. They are not necessarily regular unless you're on the pill or something like that. But that leads to thinking that if you have a shorter luteal cycle, then you aren't fertile, whereas you just have a shorter luteal cycle. And Catherine Clancy, who spoke here a couple of, year, a couple of years ago now, um, actually studied that in rural Polish women versus sort of Ivy League women, measured their luteal phases and all. The, the Polish women had shorter luteal phase, not long, no, did not have lower fertility, uh, and that their hormone levels were lower, and it was associated with higher fertility. So. Short luteal cycle is not associated with lower fertility, nor is lower hormone levels. And yet the medical community administers, administers hormones at higher than physiological levels to, quote, promote fertility. The last point is that embryo rejection is common, and it's not a mistake. So here, conceptus implants, in, and here we have the egg and the egg, which are too bad. I mean as this is called an egg and this is called an egg. But so when this implants, if it doesn't implant, you're going to get embryo rejection because the embryo hasn't implanted. If the embryo implants but doesn't send a chemical signal to the mom saying, hey, I'm here, this endometrium is going to slough off and menstruation will occur and you will have had embryo rejection. During, after, even after implantation, the embryo and the mother have to communicate chemically in order for the pregnancy to be maintained. And if that doesn't happen, embryo rejection should occur because the embryo is not behaving normally. The embryo is not doing well. And in fact, 20% or so, and this is recognized pregnancy, so there's a lot of non-recognized pregnancies where you're going to get embryo rejection. Um, and it's hard to measure, so this is definitely an underestimate. But 20% of recognized present pregnancies are terminated before 13 weeks. Embryo rejection is widespread amongst lots and lots and lots of animals. Here are a bunch of examples. Here is this little animal ovulates 50 to 800 ova at a time. We do one. Of those seven implant, most resorb litter sizes twins. This guy down here, girl, sorry, she ovulates 40 ova, they all implant, maximum litter size is 10. So 30, 75% of embryos are resorbed, rejected, whatever. Even pigs, they've got at least just eight, four embryos, or they'll say, time to start over, that's not enough. I gotta, I can do better than that. <laughs> and in fact, that's the way, that's the way evolution works. Putting energy into offspring that aren't going to themselves produce offspring is an evolutionary dead end. 
and it's not a good thing for the species, as it were. Embryo rejection is a necessary and a natural part of reproduction. It is not miscarriage. It's not a mistake. So, to sum up, we've got bias in reproductive biology, anthropocentric, androcentric, and medical bias. It's because of who did the science, but it's also maintained by popular misconceptions. But language can change. And here is a list of terms and their um, possible alternative terms. And I have some copies here, in case anybody wants one, um, of <laughs> words that you can use instead of the historical term. Words that will at least move a little bit biology to reproductive biology to a more neutral um, female active, male passive, or even just gender neutral phase. So you can take a sheet and hand out if you want. And with that, here's my acknowledgment section. Um, this is a poster that, we, that Terry and I presented. Um, it is showcasing a lot of our female scientists that we showcased in the book. These are all women that we put in our book. Um, and then I have a list of individuals that were very helpful to me, mentoring me or co-authoring with me. Um, and they're mostly pictured here, not all of them. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> and apologies for holding you late. So people who have to go, I know, <laughs> please feel free to go. Question. Yes. 